Hello, BookTube. All right, as we mentioned, I did a I did a read along video for uh, Thomas Covenant, and now we're going to do one for Dune. We're reading uh, Children of Dune this month. I am I am in the little farmhouse in Vermont, so if you hear cats meowing or children screaming, <laughs> those are the background noises of this wonderful wonderful place. Uh, but I figured. You know, Mark at Richardson Reads, he, he is my host, and he is a, a gigantic book reader and a science fiction and fantasy fan, so I knew that he would have these books here, uh, so I didn't bother to bring them. Uh, so this, this is his, his hardcover copy of Children of Dune. There is, there is our author, Frank Herbert. Uh, this is not, I was, I've been holding up those beautiful new Ace uh, paperbacks, but I didn't bring that up here. I didn't want to stuff a suitcase with books when I'm coming to a place like this. Uh, and this is part of Dune 2. 2019, which is a booktube event that I'm doing with other booktubers, in which we read one Frank Herbert Dune novel every month from July until December, and they're posting videos. But uh, I'm doing a read along as well. I'm not just doing. I'm not just going to try to summarize Children of Dune in one video, <laughs> in one video, and later on this month. And I should I should give you fair warning uh, that next month. Next month's book is God Emperor of Dune, and it's entirely possible that I will do daily videos of God Emperor of Dune. It's entirely possible that even four videos won't be enough for that. God Emperor is my favorite Dune book. I think it's incredible, and I might want to talk about it more than four times in a month. But we'll, we'll try to restrain ourselves this time. Uh, and of course, uh, because I'm dealing with a different edition here, you know, the, the, the Dune chapters aren't numbered. So the pagination of where we start and stop is going to be a little imprecise. But this is, this is uh, well, I, actually, I've had this hardcover many, many times. And right now I don't. But this is about, uh, okay, this edition is about 400 pages. Uh, and I think my Ace paperback is about, uh, is much longer than that. Just, uh, just the, the different pagination and whatnot. But the idea that I kind of sort of had with that Ace paperback was about 150 pages a week. So... I gave an arbitrary cutoff point here. I, I'm not going to be able to find it in this hardcover volume, but it doesn't matter because this first video, always when we're doing a read-along, the first video of the new book is going to be in large part talking about what's gone before in the earlier books. That's just the way of it. Uh, Children of Dune has been characterized for the last 60 years by science fiction fans as a return to form. For the Dune books, people read Frank Herbert's book Dune. It won every award that wasn't nailed down. It was immediately recognized, not immediately, but in, ra in rather short order, it was recognized as a towering classic of the genre. And everybody loved it. And then Dune Messiah came along and nobody liked it and nobody got it. And I'm, I'm not looking down my nose because I didn't either. I didn't get it either. It requires rereading. It is the one thing that Dune is not. It is a subtle book. So you have to pay attention to its moods and get into its human drama, which is an entirely smaller scale than anything that happens in Dune. And the typical re reception over the decades to this book is that it's returned to form. The children of Dune, things start happening right away. It's got a much bigger cast. There's all sorts of political and social machinations. This takes place uh, about nine years after the end of Dune Messiah. At the end of Dune Messiah, Paul Atreides, who we meet as a, as a teenager in Dune, and who is, his family is destroyed, he is an outcast in the desert, he is thrown into the, on, in, on the mercy of the Fremen, the wild desert people. He teaches them his ways, they teach him their ways, and in the course of the novel Dune, Paul ascends to the throne of the Empire, that is the ruling power of this, of this whole science fiction world. He, he is uh, tactically and strategically successful in just outmaneuvering the Emperor. Uh, and that's the note on which Dune ends. It ends on a broad note of just uh, loud triumph. And in Dune Messiah, years have passed, and it's, it's all turned bitter. It's all been wormwood for Paul, for Paul Atreides. He is the ruler of an empire far mightier than the one that he supplanted, mainly thanks to those Fremen desert warriors who became his shock troops for the whole galaxy. They were an unstoppable physical force who swept a wave of jihad all across the galaxy. Uh, and that's the Paul Atreides that we meet in Dune Messiah. And a lot of, I was very gratified to see that in our read-along of Dune Messiah, a lot of you liked it a lot. You came around to it as some of you were reading it for the second time and found it much more enjoyable. I got a lot of emails <laughs> on the subject. You, uh, you can always email me, keep in mind. I don't, I don't say this in every video, but you can always email me uh, the, the very first thing that comes up about me on Google. 
is my email. So feel free to email me. It's, it's at st period donahue at gmail. I get a, I got a lot of responses about doing Messiah. People loved rereading it. They loved going through it slowly. Uh, and uh, at the end of Dune Messiah, I'm assuming here that if you're watching a read-along that's well along in the books that it's talking about, you're not worried about spoilers. I'm not going to worry about spoilers. You know, you're, you're adults. We're all adults here. So you, you know better than to watch a detailed read-along if you are worried about surprises in these books. But at the end of Dune Messiah, Paul is blind and he has been blinded in an incident that happens in the book and he's totally disenchanted and he walks into the desert, apparently to his death, which is an old Fremen custom. The Fremen don't carry any dead weight, so cripples, senile people, blind people walk into the desert and let the giant sandworms or the storms take them. They are not a burden to the tribe. Paul Atreides walks into the desert at the end of Dune Messiah and, by implication, turns over his empire to his sister Alia and his two little baby children, um, uh, Ganima and Leto. And those three characters share something in common. They're, Dune is, for those of you who are maybe joining us right at this book, Dune is the source of the, the spice melange, which is a powerful, addictive substance that activates latent psionic powers, it, it lengthens life, uh, and if, <laughs> it's a little bit complicated to get into, that's why I'm talking about these videos, these first videos are always recap, there's a society of sort of super nuns in this future world called the Bene Gesserit, and they use the spice melange for a memory trance. Their reverend mothers are able to access the cellular memories of all the reverend mothers who have gone before them. It's a rite of passage for reverend mothers. It stops you, it moves you from being an acolyte in the Bene Gesserit to being a reverend mother. It takes lots of preparation. It's done very cautiously. And the Bene Gesserit have always had a stricture against pregnant women going through it because the spice agony that gives them these heightened powers will affect the fetuses. And that is what the Bene Gesserit have always considered an abomination, a fetus that's awoken not only to full adult awareness in the womb, but to a million full adult awareness is in the room. They've, those things have been considered abomination. And for a couple of different reasons, that, has been, that is true of not only Paul Atreides' sister, Alia, who's an adult in this book, and is effectively a regent running the empire for the two children, but also for the two children. Leto and Ganima were, are, were brought to full awareness in the spice agony when they were still babies. In fact, we meet them as little babies at the end of Dune Messiah. And they know many, many languages. They have memory, many memories of many worlds. That's going to be a challenge on its own. At the end of Dune Messiah, you can easily think, okay, if we're going to follow the story of these children, they're going to be pretty hard to write. And they, of course, are the stars of this book. This book takes place a few years later than at the end of Dune Messiah. Paul Atreides is still gone. The Empire is being ruled by Alia. And the children are now not babies anymore. They are still... They're still little kids. They look like little kids. But Ganima and especially Leto, all throughout this book, are constantly reminding adults that I look like a child, but I'm not actually a child. I'm actually millions of years old in my memories, in my remembered experiences. It's just this body that happens to look like a child. Uh, and it's an uneasy uh, relationship that they have with, with their aunt, with Alia. And the reason why becomes clear in the first hundred and something pages that we're reading today. The reason why is because it turns out it's, it's not just you coming to full awareness in, as a result of the spice agony that makes you an abomination. An abomination is something else again. Because in this setup that Frank Herbert has devised, your cellular memories are individual to each person that held them. So you have your own memories, but your, your cellular mechanism has also been awakened to, for instance, the memories of your mother and your grandmother and your great-grandmother. And those memories don't enter into some sort of a, a potpourri. They stay aligned with that personality, with that person. And it becomes, in effect, a gigantic chorus of voices inside your head. And it turns out in the course of the pages that we're reading today that the real nature of abomination is someone who doesn't deal with that crowd correctly. 
<laughs> the the idea, the, the image that, that Leto brings up a couple of times in these pages is that those people are just waiting for a chance to live again. <laughs> they have, yes, you have their memories, but they would like your body, please, and thank you. If You have to learn how to control that massive crowd. And we get some very wonderful scenes here where Leto and Ganima talk to each other about their own efforts at controlling that crowd. It's why they would like to put off the spice agony themselves. They're not really sure what it would be like at this young age, still learning their powers to go through the spice agony as adults themselves. Uh, and that kind of tension, they don't get along with Alia, and she doesn't get along with them, but they are Muad'Dib's children. She can't out openly move against them. And we're not sure what, that she would want to, except that in these pages we see that she has failed at the effort of controlling those past voices, those ancestral voices in her cellular memory, in her mind, she has failed in her efforts to control them. And there's one of those voices in particular who wants to dominate all the others and wants to dominate her. And that voice is Baron Harkonnen from the Dune, from the, the first novel, Dune. It turns out, we learn in the course of that book, that, uh, the, that Paul Atreides and, by extension, Alia, have Harkonnen blood. They have, they have a large component, a large bloodline of Harkonnen ancestry in their genetic makeup. And sure enough, Baron Harkonnen is one of those voices in Alia's great, you know, mental chorus. And he wants to take over. He wants to control her. And it's a weird relationship. And it's thrilling. Absolutely thrilling. Now, I, I reread uh, Dune Messiah for our read-along, and I found a lot more in it. Every time I reread it, I find a lot more in it. But it is not a thrilling book. <laughs> it is not a fast-paced book. It doesn't do what Dune does. Any of the things that Dune does. And this book does. <laughs> so you, you did the, that original reaction to these first three books, back when this was just going to be a trilogy, you can see on the cover of Mark's book, the climax to the Dune trilogy. <laughs> because nobody thought there would be any more, including Frank Herbert, no matter what his son says. Frank Herbert was perfectly happy to leave this with vague intimations. He was willing to, to include this with this book. I'm very glad that he didn't, <laughs> but because I think I'm in the minority. I think the last three Dune books are easily as good as the first three. <laughs> Nobody believes that, but we'll get to it. I will. I will win you over. <laughs> uh, but that that interplay, not only between Alia and her earlier memories, and between Leo and Ganima, but also the tension between the twins and their aunt, is thrilling. And in these pages, that that thrilling tension between them is intensified even more because Paul's mother, Lady Jessica, who has retired from Dune, she's gone to her home planet of Caladan, decides to return to Dune. And she brings with her Gurney Halleck, the, the troubadour warrior that, that, uh, she knew, that we knew from, from Dune, the novel, and it immediately becomes obvious, in her very first scene on Dune, it immediately becomes obvious that she has an agenda in mind. She's not just coming to see her, her, her daughter and her grandkids. She's, she has an agenda in mind. In, in fact, it's possible that she has the Bene Gesserit's agenda in mind. It's possible that she has returned to the Sisterhood's ways and wants to safeguard these twins as anomalies that the Sisterhood does not know about and wants to control. The opening scene when she arrives at, 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 on Dune in this book is great. Because she has not coordinated with Alia. She coordinates with Stilgar, who's an old-style chief of the Fremen, so that the very first thing that happens when her craft comes down in the square is that her soldiers rush into the mob that has gathered and arrest people. They arrest a handful of people for torture and execution without consulting Alia. It's a, it's a naked power move. That And when the two of them talk about it, Alia pretends to be angrier than she is, and Lady Jessica pretends to be calmer than she is. And all of that is captured with exactly the same kind of multi-level, take-no-prisoners, mile-a-minute intensity uh, that, that Herbert did in Dune, and that he very consciously doesn't do in Dune Messiah. So this is a, bit, a bucket of cold water when you're coming straight from that middle book to this one. And that is what we're reading today. That is basically the premise of what we're doing today. Those are the tensions that boil up in the, at, right at the beginning of this book. There are a handful of them. There's, what are Leto and Ganima? And are they able to control what they are? There's, what is the nature of this abomination, of this takeover that's happening inside Alia, who is, keep in mind, the most powerful person in the galaxy in this book? 
what are the tensions between Lady Jessica and her return, the mother of Muad'Dib? She also cannot be moved against openly. What are her intentions when she comes back to Dune, the planet that saw her beloved husband die, the place we get the strong impression she never intended to return to? And there's one more bit of tension. And a lot of you saw this coming, and I don't blame you. Uh, there's one more bit of tension in these opening pages, and that is a new character called the Preacher, who has wandered in from the deep deserts, from the, from the, the, the barren wastelands of Shai Hulud, and who is attracting more and more crowds. And it's entirely possible that the Preacher is Paul Muad'Dib. <laughs> it's entirely possible that Paul Atreides is back in this book, and that he is now has fashioned himself as a kind of scourge against the very religious empire that he built. All of that is bubbling uh, all around in these opening pages. And uh, I, of course, want to know what you made of it. Uh, those of you who are turning to, to Children of Dune, having read it before, will already know this is a cracker of a book. It's completely different from Dune Messiah. And those of you who are reading for the first time and just finished Dune Messiah... I'd love to hear from you, but I'm assuming that your impression is, wow, well, this is we're right back to what Dune was like. The only, <laughs> the only other point that I want to make before we wrap up, because I, I, we've got all sorts of adventures to go on <laughs> here in Vermont. Uh, the only other point that I want to make, and uh, feel free to discuss it. I've been discussing it, you know, in, in Voxer and in email with a bunch of you, but I wanted to bring it up because it's so essential to these books and it's so weird. <laughs> and that is Frank Herbert's conception of those cellular memories, of those internal choruses, those people that, that suddenly you're able to somehow summarize and pass along not just information or images, but a personality. Uh, in Star Trek, you Star Trek fans will know it from Star Trek III, the Katra. <laughs> but that, that term, nothing like that term is used here, but Herbert is clearly phrasing and basing this thing on a kind of scientific patois that doesn't apply. That isn't how memory works. <laughs> you, your cells do not have any component of your personality. They don't have any component of anything that you acquire day by day, decade by decade, lifetime by lifetime. Acquired traits do not make their way into your cellular makeup. There is no way, once Baron Harkonnen's heart stops beating, there's no way that your genetic inheritance from him would give you him, would give you, you know, the Disney villain. No, there's no way that that would happen. There's no way that you would have ancestors from 10,000 years ago who, you, where you can see through their eyes in your memories walking on the sand or anything like that. That's not how memory works. That's not how cells work. That's not how genetics work. And Herbert wrote this book 50 years ago, but he wrote it pl in plenty of time to know that. He clearly has a different idea, a, a, a new invention, of what it is these characters are using, what they're seeing, what they're passing along. And I find it fascinating. Once you, I mean, you, if you use his, just his vague terminology in the course of this book, you'll think, oh yeah, genetic memory. Oh yeah. So, so everything up until the point when you died, that suddenly is the possession of the person who takes your memories. But when you step back and think about it, that doesn't make any sense. It, that also, like the Spice, like the Spacing Guild, like the Sandworms, that is a creation of Frank Herbert. That is, a, that is another element of the science fiction in these books. And I've been thinking about it. Once you step back and you see that, you start to think about, okay, well, then what is this? How does the author actually conceive of this? And I'm wondering if, that, if any of you have that problem, especially those of you who are reading these books for the first time. Are you wondering what it is, for instance, that Leto and Alia have awoken to in the womb? When you got to that scene at the end of Dune Messiah, wait a minute, well, how do these kids know English? How, how do they know what a knife is or who their father is by face or anything like that? How do they know anything? When you got to that scene, did you wonder about that? What Herbert means by shared or passed along memories? I'd love to hear about it. I, it the more I think about it, the more I think that it uh, uh, doesn't get the attention it deserves, considering that the whole of these books are based on it. Uh, I mean, the thing that makes Paul Muad'Dib so impressive, so awe-inspiring to his soldiers is his otherworldly knowledge. It's not just his prescience, his ability to foresee the future. It's also all of those memories. And all of those alternate memories in his head are obviously what makes him crucial to the Bene Gesserit. And they're they are the, that chorus on the inside is the founding fundamental characteristic of Leto and Ganima. So it's central to the book, but it is not scientific. So I'm curious to know what you make of that and what allowances you make for it. Uh, but that's, 
that's it. That is Children of Doom. That is part one. Now we're gonna. I, I I have this book here, so I don't. I don't really want to. Ordinarily, I go to roughly the chapter where we're gonna read to next, and uh, tell you how it starts. But this is not the book that I'm. This is not the version that I'm using. It. It's confusing enough as it is without without going on from there. So basically, for next Sunday. Let's just read another 150 pages. You're not going to find it hard. This is a fantastically readable book. But let's just read another 150 pages for next Sunday. And I will be uh, careful. I've tried to be careful in this video so that I'll, to take into account the varying page numbers so that I, I'll try not to give away anything that's lying right in front of you as a reader for this book. I'll, I'll speak in generalities about the next 150 pages. So that's where we'll take up next time. We're going to read Children of Dune throughout the month of September. And then we'll move on <laughs> to God Emperor. And I'm going to have to figure out, I'll probably have to talk with Mark about it. I'm going to have to figure out what I want to do. God Emperor is my favorite of these books. I want to give it more attention than just four videos. But maybe that's too much attention. So, so I'm going to wrap this up for now. That is Children of Doom. Uh, I'm going to shut off the video and go have adventures with the bean. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll be back. We have plenty more to talk about. So I'll see you soon. Thank you, Book